Okay, why don't we begin our study with a bracha? Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedeshanu Soak the Libre Torah. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so last week we um, we were looking at the structure of the Psuke de Zimra. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move something around here a second. All right, we were looking at the structure of Psuke de Zimra, and uh, we found that the you know based on a few different passages in the Talmud, which seem to reflect the ideas of some of the, the early Talmudic sages, um, there's an idea of, first of all, spending some time in preparation before we begin the Shacharit service, the morning service. There's an idea of reciting Hallel on a daily basis of some sort. Um, and so that led to the service that we call Psuke de Zimra, verses of song, with um, kind of the center of them being the recitation of the Hallel contained in the, at the end of the Book of Psalms, Psalms 145 through 150. And we saw also how, um, not in Talmudic times, but, but sometime afterwards, um, there were blessings created for, to both introduce and conclude this recitation of Psalms. And then we saw that that wasn't, it wasn't enough to just uh, do that. So we saw some additional material got placed in there. Um, material from the Bible, mostly from the book of Psalms with a few verses here and there from Proverbs or, uh, um, uh, or uh, Chronicles. Chronicles, thank you. Um, and then there's a di an additional section that, um, that came after the Psalms that was a second biblical interlude, which has kind of a, a, a different feel. So that's what we're going to start with. We're going to look at that. We're going to look a little bit at Yishtabach in detail. And then as promised, we're going to look at Ashrei. Um, so, uh, so let's jump in. I'm just gonna... uh, okay. So um, what we're going to see is two words that have not featured as prominently until now are now going to be featured a lot. So one of those words is Baruch, which means blessed. Yeah. And another word is Amen. Amen. What does Amen mean? So be it. Okay. No, Amen means Amen. Amen is Amen. <laughs> but doesn't it mean so be it? So be it perhaps, but it's connected to the word Emunah, faith, or uh, perhaps Emet, truth. And it, it's tied into the, to the idea of um, really of constancy or, or reliability, God's constancy. But the word amen itself is, is a word that is used either to um, affirm someone else's blessing, right? So someone says a blessing and I say, I, I hear you. I acknowledge the blessing you just recited. Or it's a way of me saying, um, what you just said counts for me too. Right, so um, I'm, I'm expressing my kavana to be included in your blessing um, by saying amen at the, end of, at the end of your bracha. So the connection of baruch and amen, the, they, they kind of go together, right? You would say amen after somebody says a baruch. Um, so let's take a look. Um, this is, as soon as we finish Psalm 150, we get um, this short little prayer, and it's comprised of several verses, and let's see if we can find the page number. 100. 100. Okay, so if you are in Sidur Sim Shalom for Shabbat and festivals, it's on 100 at the very bottom of the page. If you have a weekday, then it'll be on the bottom of 25. It'll look exactly the same though, on both. In both. And if you have a different Sidur, it'll be on a different page. <laughs> you know, mine is different. 
Which seed door do you have? I have the daily, the gray one, kind of grayish, weekdays. 25 at the bottom. Uh huh. got it. I was this looking is... at the top. <laughs> so um, as we've seen in the first section of biblical interludes, we get a smattering of verses kind of gathered in. And, but we're going to see that these verses, they uh, have something in common. So I'm just going to read them out loud. So the first one, Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen Ve'amen, right? Psalm 89. Blessed is Adonai forever, Amen and Amen. All right, next one. Baruch Adonai Mitzion, Shochein Yerushalayim, Hallelujah. The blessed is Adonai from Zion, the one who dwells in Jerusalem, Hallelujah. Okay, again, we begin with Baruch. Next, Baruch Adonai Elohim Elos Hei Yisrael Oseniflot Luvado, Uvaruch Shein Kvodo Le'olam, V'malech Vodo Kol Ha'aretz, Amen Amen. All right, blessed is God Adonai, the God of Israel, sole worker of wonders, and blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the entire earth, Amen and Amen. Amen. All right, so notice this, the, the first and the third one end with an Amen and Amen, right, that double Amen. Um, all three begin with Baruch. In, in the Psalm 72, there's actually two verses, each of which begins with Baruch, right? The idea of blessing. So why are these here? Hmm. Well, it's right after that Psalm Hallelujah. I right forget what, yeah. yeah. I forget what number it is. But maybe it has a, 150, right. So maybe it has a connection to that. Okay. Miriam puts out a theory. All right, and she's right. There is a connection. <laughs> so so the, the book of Psalms is actually divided into five books. So there are five different books that make up the book of Psalms. Um, obviously, Psalm 150 is the conclusion of one of those five books, right? Because it's the, the, the end of the entire book. Um, Turns out Psalm 72 is also the conclusion of one of the books. And Psalm 89 is a conclusion of, of one of the books of Psalms. And so um, just as by reciting Psalm 150, it's, we're saying, okay, we're going to recite this one Psalm, but it's, it's kind of a stand-in. It's as if we've recited the entire book of Psalms. So by including some additional verses that also um, conclude, let's say, smaller sections of the book of Psalms, um, Perhaps that is also meant to send the message that, you know, by, by, set, by reciting this single verse, you know, we're, um, you know, our intention is, you know, if we only had the time, that our intention was to have recited the entire, the entire book. Um, so, and I, I, I think the, the Amen the Amen is a way of kind of punctuating, punctuating that, that message. Mm. Um, but as we're going to see in a moment, the Baruch theme is something that is going to continue. Um, all right, so the next two sections come from Chronicles and from Exodus. It's too much for me to include on the screen, but we can look at it in our Sidurim. So immediately after the, uh, the, the three Psalms that we just saw, um, what's the next word? Baruch. No, uh Right. So again, we've got a Baruch here. All right. So um, would someone like to read this paragraph in English for us? Oh, David praised Adonai. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Pay attention David, to the themes that come up here. Okay. David praised Adonai in the presence of all the assembled, saying, Praised are you, God of our father Israel, from the past to the future, your, yours are greatness and power, Adonai, glory and splendor and majesty, for everything in the heavens and on earth is yours. Serenity is yours. You are exalted as ruler of all. You are the source of wealth and honor. Dominion over all the earth is yours. Might and courage from, come from you. Greatness and strength are your gifts. We praise you now, our God, and we extol your glory. 
Okay, so that was from Chronicles. I apologize, my citation mm -hmm. here is incorrect. It should have been 10 to 13. Okay. So we get a passage from Nehemiah. All right. What were the pat? What were the themes that you caught in uh, Chronicles? Well, it's glorifying God. Everything. Lots of praise. Everything. Yeah, lots of praise to God. It, it's very cosmic. Cosmic. Yes. There's uh, some themes of creation here. What else? What else do you notice? Everything belongs to God. How about, this, how about the setting of the prayer? Well, David All prays Adonai. It's David. The presence. David. So David, and of course, the Psalms are also attributed to David. Mm -hmm. right? So we, we've continued on a theme. And notice the setting as well. He's doing it in the presence of all the assembled. Yeah. Right? So they're, you know, obviously this is not shachari the way that we know it, but people have gotten together. David has convened them and is now praising God in public with other people. And so the connections are, sh should seem fairly obvious. So this is actually a great passage to include in some fashion in, um, in daily worship. Now let's let's continue. So would, would someone else like to read Nehemiah? I'll read Nehemiah. I just right. read Nehemiah. <laughs> you alone are, are Adonai. You created the heavens, the high heavens, and all their array, the land and all that is on it, the seas and all they contain. You sustain them all. The hosts of the heavens revere you. You are Adonai, the God who chose Abram, Abram and brought him out of, out of Ur of the Chaldees. Good enough. <laughs> you named him Abraham and found him and found him in him a faithful servant. Okay, so um, now Nehemiah, this is a uh, a great scene, uh, which is quite possibly the first public Torah reading um, mm. that ever took place. Nehemiah and Ezra convene all of the Israelites. They build a big bima. They t read Torah in public. They translate it to so that everybody can understand what's in it, and they say some rare prayers. Right. And so this is a prayer that appears there, again, in public. What are the themes here? It's again, Adonai is praised. Creation and, uh, and Abraham. Re re recognition that um, he's, he, he sustains all, sustains them all, which means he has control more or less so again so we go we have themes of creation and then god is kind of the you know i think sherry you put it god owns everything right yeah. you know, like the the whole world belongs belongs to god right. um would someone else like to continue the the second paragraph from nehemia sure you made <clears throat> you made a covenant with him to give the land of the canaanites the hittites and the amorites the parasites almost sounds like parasites, uh, the Jebusites and the Giragashites to his descendants. And you kept your promise for you were just. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Sea of Reeds. With signs and wonders, you confronted Pharaoh, all of his servants and all the people of his land because you knew his, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you knew of their shameless treatment of our ancestors and you gained for yourself a name that lives on to this day. You divided the sea for our ancestors and they passed through it as if on dry land. But their, pursu uh, but their pursuers you cast into the depths like a stone into turbulent waters. Okay, what are the themes? <laughs> We've gone from creation to Abraham to the Exodus. Mm -hmm. The promise of the that land. Was fast. <laughs> right? and, and promise of land, right? So, yeah. so and, and that's tied into covenant, right? So we have specific mentions of the covenant to Abraham and then God fulfilling that covenant with the Israelites in Egypt. Um, and then of course, uh, a, a mentioning of the Exodus. So you can, you can see there's actually a gradual transition of, of themes. And all of these themes, by the way, are going to come up again in, um, in Shacharit. So, um, so perhaps we're foreshadowing something. We're using examples of biblical prayers um, to kind of finish up our, our, our preparations for Shacharit. Now that, of course, all leads up to Exodus. 
And so then we turn the page, uh, and now we are in Exodus chapter 14. Uh, would someone else like to read uh, the, the verses 30 to 31? Sure. Oh, yeah. that, thus, Adonai saved the people of Israel from the Egyptians on that day. Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore of the sea. When the people of Israel witnessed the great power that Adonai wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared Adonai. But they had trust in Adonai and his servant Moses. And give us one more verse, Libby. That would be, please. Then Moses and the people Israel sang this song to Adonai. Perfect. So now we're actually reading the event itself and the celebration of that event. event. And again, the celebration is a public worship, let's say, right? Moses now is the one who is leading everybody in singing praises to God um, after... Um, after successfully crossing the, uh, the Sea of Reeds and getting away from the Egyptians. And so we've got three different passages here, which represent three different scenes in biblical times in which there is a convening of the people and a public worship and praise of God. And, uh, and so, and all this, of course, foreshadows the same themes that we're going to see um, and um, perhaps puts us in in the good company of our, of our ancestors as we're about to go into prayer. We're not going to read through the Song of the Sea in its entirety, uh, but I'll, I'll just kind of remind us always to pay attention of the, the historical development of, of the Sidur, that this, at, at some point in medieval times, I'm not sure if we know exactly when or where it first was introduced, this, this section also was... Um, was placed into the morning worship. And of course, and I think we mentioned this before, um, the idea of remembering the Exodus on a, every single day is, uh, is also a very important idea that the, uh, the rabbis developed in, the, in Talmudic times. It appears in the Haggadah. And so for us to um, do it, we, we have actually have several opportunities to do that over the course of our, our daily prayers. Uh, and this there is the uh, there is a by Elim Adonai in there, which we say isn't that in the Amida, uh, or before the Amida? Yeah, well, we say right. So that and that that is every day in Shachari. That that's where the Exodus theme appears, right before the Amida. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I did include the Nehemia part. All right. Now let's see what Abu Darham is another very important medieval source on tefillah. He wrote a big commentary on all of our, all of our prayers. Uh, so it, it's important both in terms of knowing what he had in front of him, but also um, there's a, a tremendous amount of scholarship about the meaning and the purpose and you know, theological ideas. And so, uh, so here he, he gives us a bit of an explanation. Would someone like to read in the words of Abu Darham? And the reason they are accustomed to say Vayevarech David and Shirat Hayam is because all 15 expressions of praise that are arranged in the blessing Yishtabach, as explained in the Mechilta, uh, are from Shirat Hayam and from the verses of Vayevarech David. Okay, so a couple explanations here. First of all, Vayevarech David and Shirat Hayam, that's the section from Chronicles and Exodus. He doesn't mention Nechemi here, right? So... Why are these sections here? So now he's given a um, kind of a literary explanation for what they're doing here. So he's saying that there are 15 expressions of praise that appear in these biblical prayers that then found their way into Yishtabach or were, were utilized, were taken in order to craft Yishtabach by wh whoever it was who did that. The Mechilta, is, uh, is an early commentary on the book of Exodus. All right, it's considered to be one of the uh, Midrash, uh, not commentary, a Midrash collection. It's considered a Midrash halacha, so uh, legal types of material. Um, so let's, let's see if we can find those 15 expressions of praise. All right, here is Yishtabach, arranged perhaps a little bit differently. In our Sidurim, you'll find it in the Sidur Sim Shalom for Shabbat. It's on 106. 
in for a weekday it's on 29. Okay. And we saw that we saw Yishtabach last week and, and we saw that it was really the closing blessing for Psuke de Zimra with the opening blessing being Baruch She'amar. And really the, those together they represent a single blessing. And for some strange reason the person who leads Shacharit takes over before Yishtabach. So we have a different person concluding Psuke de Zimra mm -hmm as opposed to the person who started it. But do we know who composed Yishtabach? Maybe. All right, let's look at Yishtabach. Yishtabach. So the word here is shevach, which means praise. Yishtabach is uh, basically to become praise. Let him become praise. Let him be praised. Who, who is God going to be praised by? The people. Us, right? We're about to do it. Let him be praised, right? Shimcha la'ad malkenu ha'el. The next, next four words. Shimcha is your name. La'ad means forever. Malkenu is our king. Ha'el means the God. And it's followed by ha'melech ha'gadol va'kadosh b'shemayim va'aret. So some words that modify God. Look at the first letter of those four words. Four, yeah, the first letter of each of those four words. Okay. <laughs> Shlomo, right. Shlomo. Shlomo. So this is a fairly common technique that um, Paitanim, that uh, liturgical poets do, is they sign their work, right? Mm. A lot of musical composers do that also, right? <laughs> so, um, so perhaps this was written by Shlomo. We don't know for sure, but uh, um, that introduces the theme. Right? We're going to praise God's name, the, the King, the Great One, the Holy One, Bashamayim Uva'aretz, in the heavens and on earth. For you, Lord our God and God of our fathers, pertain. And now we're going to get a list. Let's see if we can count them. Shir Ushvacha Halel Vizimra Oz Umemshala Netzach Gedula Uvura Tihila Vitiferet. Kedusha umalchut brachot vehodaot. Fifteen. May Ataviyat alam from now and forever. All right. Fifteen words of praise. Right. Now we've got our English tried uh, tries its best to translate these words. Um, do these words represent different things? You know, maybe. Um, but but again, I think I've mentioned before that one of the uh, things that we see in the prayers is that because. We're, our words are incomplete relative to, to God. So we can't even try to begin to, to praise God or to describe God or say anything about God. So we're gonna, the best we can do is to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it and uh, give God all the words. Now, how about the number 15? Does that ring a bell? Which one is that? Um, from the... From the guy who we read a moment ago. Ah, so yeah, so Abu Dharam said that the, he, he points out that these 15 terms were all taken from the pre previous prayers that we saw. Um, I don't want to take the time to look at every single one, but um, I'll just briefly look at the Chronicles one. Baruch um, Elohei Yisrael Avinu Me'olam Be'adolam. So blessed are you, Adonai, God of Israel, our Father, from now and forever. Lecha Adonai, to you, God, Hagedula, greatness, Vehagvura, uh, might, Vehatiferet, uh, splendor, Vehanetzach, uh, eternity, Vehahod, majesty, that one doesn't appear here. Um, so anyway, so these are all words that appear in the in the um, in in the biblical material. The number fifteen is significant. It's fifteen is the number of um, the ascent psalms, the Shir Hamaalot. So those are like in the twenties. After for Birkat Hamazon on Shabbat, we sing Shir Hamaalot, Shir Hamaalot. That that's one psalm out of fifteen psalms that all begin Shir Hamaalot, song of ascents, like of of going up. There were 15 steps in the temple that the Levites would stand on and would sing on. And as people walked up those steps to get inside, they would be greeted by, by this Levitical choir singing them in. And so like each, each uh, so by singing the, uh, let's say the 15 Psalms of Ascent, 
presumably these were the psalms that the Levites were singing and you know each step gets its own song of ascent. So the, the number 15 is a significant number. It is also the number of yud Hey, right? So the first two letters of God's name, Yud is 10, mm -hmm. Hey is five, we get another 15. So 15 is kind of a, uh, a, a very significant number. So it is a very good number. If we're gonna think about, okay, we need to have come up with a certain number of um, synonymous descriptions of God's qualities or praises. So 15 is a good one. When did Chai come into being? Uh, relatively recently. Okay. Yeah. Um, as a number, yeah. As a, um, yeah, uh, 15, 26, and 39 are actually older numbers of significance. So uh, let's and 36 yeah. also. Um, I wanted to say, uh, oh, well, one other thing. This is not all of Yishtabach, by the way. Um, this, this part of Yishtabach gets us up to, um, up to the blessing. Yeah, and then uh, uh, right after this comes the, the closing bracha, Baruch Ata Hashem. So we kind of have a long closing bracha. But uh, we, we can see the, um, this is not just a smattering of words, right? There is very deliberate structure in this prayer, right? The person who composed this knew exactly what he or she was doing, probably he, um, used exactly 15 words, not 14, not 16. Um, and uh, and even signed signed his name. What about Gematria? Gematria. Um, I there might be. I, I don't know. It, uh, one, one way or the other. But there often is Gematria that that's that's in here as well. So um, you know, this is like uh, I always liken this kind of thing to uh, like Dan Brown stuff, like symbology, where you've got these hidden kind of these hidden messages or hidden meanings that are contained within the, the, the visible structure of what we can see right in front of us. That if, but if, that if we know kind of the, the deeper levels of meaning that, you know, that's the, the, there's, um, what is it? There's, um, there's meaning contained in the form itself. Right. Rabbi, isn't the word for complete something like shalma, shal shalom? Shalom. So the word shalom isn't it these letters for complete? Ah, Shen, so, Shen, yes. Shen. so Shlomo and the root word of Shlomo, Shin mm -hmm. Lamed Mem, mm -hmm. is, the, is also the same word that's used for Shalom, which, is, mm -hmm. which we translate typically as peace, but it's, it's really the idea of wholeness or completeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder if this is, could also be thought of as like, it's com the, the- Oh yeah, we've just- uh, Completed, Sukkot, wow. uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we try to, we try to in, symbolically include the complete book of Psalms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on to Ashray. So now we're back to the Talmud. We're going to start in the Talmud. Uh, this is from uh, Bab the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Brachot, page 6b. And here's what it says. Amar Rabbi Elazar. So Rabbi Elazar said, Amar Rabbi Avina. He said it in the name of Rabbi Avina. Kol ha'omer tehilal David b'cho yom shalosh pe'amim muvtach lo shehu ben ha'olam haba. Anybody who says tehilal David, tehilah is the singular of tehilim, so it means a psalm of David, b'cho yom, every day, shalosh pe'amim, three times, Muftachlo, it is certain for him, guaranteed, Shehu ben ha'olam haba, that he is literally a son of the world to come. Right? This is somebody who belongs in the world to come. Wow, that's that's big. That's that's a great statement. <laughs> what is Tehilala David? David. Psalm of David. The house of David. What is a oh, psalm of David? How do we know that they're talking about 145? 
Yeah. Well, let's find out. All right. So this is the introduction to a psalm. There are a number of psalms that begin Tihilala David. So we got to figure out which one we're talking about. Next question. My Tama, what's the reason? Ilema, which is if we say, shall we say, Mishum da'atya ba'alaf bet? Shall we say that it's because it comes in, an, in, the, in the alaf bet, right? It's in alphabetical order, right? So already now we know what exactly which psalm they're talking about. Um, I think there's only one Tihilal David psalm that, that goes in alphabetical order. That's Psalm 145, all right? But it, that is not the only psalm that um, is an acrostic, however. Neima ashreit mimeidarech de'atya bitmanya apin. Right? So, all right, if you're interested in the alphabetical or nature of it, um, we should say, Ashreit Mime Darech, right? Happy are they who are upright in the way. This is Psalm 119, is the first verse of Psalm 119. Why? The Atya Bitmanya Apin, because it comes in eight faces, right? It appears eight times. This is, so Psalm 119 is not just an acrostic, it is an eightfold acrostic, right? Mm -hmm. So we start with Aleph. Now we get eight verses in a row, all beginning with Aleph. Then we go to Bet. Eight verses in a row, beginning with Bet, right? This is the longest psalm in the book of Psalms. This is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, right? It's 22 times eight verses long. So if you want to do an acrostic, you should, you should have picked Psalm 119. So the reason can't be why we chose 145 is because it's an acrostic. We need a different reason. So let's let's find a different reason. Ella mishum de itbe poter et yadecha. All right. So rather, it's because it contains in it poter et yadecha. So a particular verse, right? The verse poter et yadecha. You open up your hand, and that's the only section. That's the first half. That's the section that the Talmud cites here. But it means the whole verse and you satisfy every living thing with favor, or you satisfy the need of every living thing. All right. Neyma, all right. So, but if that was your reason, right? Neyma halel hagadol, dichtiv beinoten lechem l'chol basar. Well, if the reason was for poteach et yadecha, you open up your, the, you open up your hand verse, then we should have picked Halel Hagadol, the great Halel, right? That's Psalm 136, because it contains a verse, Notein lechem l'chol basar ki le'olam chasto, right? He gives bread to all flesh, uh, whose kindness endures forever, right? It's the exact same concept, right? God feeds everything. And uh, so why do we need this Psalm 145? We've got another, another Psalm that does it at least as well, if not, if not better. All right, so we need a, we need a real reason. No, it's got both. <laughs> That's the answer that the, the Gemara gives, right? It's not only is it an acrostic, it also contains the idea of God feeding every living creature. And because it contains those two things, therefore, that's why Rabbi Elazar, in the name of Rabbi Avina, says that a person who recites this psalm three times a day is guaranteed a place in the world to come. All right. Now, I... I um, I just want to point out that the, um, the what is the reason on down, that's all from the Gemara. This is later, uh, a later level, layer of the, of, the, uh, of the Talmud. The initial statement, right, is we've just got a tradition that it's good to say this, this uh, psalm three times a day. And then the Gemara is trying to figure out why. And so the Gemara introduced two possible things, two things that are, let's say, distinct about Psalm 145. And it does it in its typical kind of question and answer, you know, um, challenge refutation type of, um, type of style. So, but, but, but this is what we're left with. This is, this is the reason that the tradition accepts uh, for why we say Psalm 145 three times. Uh, Psalm 145 can be found on page 96 in this book. And on page 20, uh, which page is it on page 21? 21 in the weekday. See, 21. What was the first one? 
96 in the Shabbat and, and 21 96. in the weekday. So apparently the lack of the nun is no barrier. Oh, we're like, oh, no, 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 you're jumping the gun here. We haven't <laughs> that. Yeah. Relax, Max. Don't, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 96. I'll have to pay it back with an extra fifth. All right. All right. Here's Psalm 145. You can see it here on screen. Uh, what are the first words of Psalm 145? <laughs> David. David. And then? <laughs> okay, there, there we go. Right. Now notice in our Sidur, these are not the opening words of the prayer. We've got something different. We'll get to that in a moment. I want to point out just the, the acrostic. Um, here, my, you see my arrow? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there, that, that's really, Tiala David is really just the kind of the superscription, the, um, it's not a title, but like, it's not really part of the psalm, right? Arumimcha begins the psalm. So, um, Aleph, next, Bechol Yom, Bet. Next, Gadol, Gimel. Dalit, hey, vav, zayin, chet, tet, yud, kaf, lamid, mem, samech. We missed, we missed a nun. Uh, ayin, pei, tzadi, kuf, reishin, taf. And the last line begins what? Tehillat Adonai Dabar, right? The phrases of God, I will um, let my mouth uh, speak. And vayivarech kol basar, and let all flesh Bless Shem, his holy name forever and ever. All right. What is the last <laughs> verse of our Ashrei in the Sidur? No, no, you don't. Uh, higher on the page. That's not the last word. Next. Right. Next. Right. Next. Right. Next. That's yeah, a vav. That is a vav. That is not the last letter of the olive. That, that is not part of Psalm 145. Uh -huh. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. All right. This is a Ooh. scroll that was uh, found in a jar in Qumran. Sorry, these are the Dead Ooh. Sea Scrolls. All uh -huh. right. This was found in Cave 11. Um, this is Psalm 145. Oh. So let's look at it. Uh, do you see where my uh, my arrow is? Yeah. Okay. So we've got oh, my arrow just disappeared. Okay. Tehila le David, Mimcha, and then we've got these four strange things. Those don't look like Hebrew. Oh. This is Yud Hey Vav Hey, in uh, I guess like. Proto Hebrew, huh. or we would say maybe actual Hebrew, <laughs> right? as opposed to the Aramaic alphabet. All right, so we, we do we do God's name Yud Hey Vav Hey here. So Tilal David Arumimcha Adonai, right? Elohai Hamelech Vavaracha Shimcha Leolam Vaed. Now what's what's next? Can you read that? Oh. Baruch. Baruch. Adonai. Adonai. Ut. Ubaruch. Ubaruch. Baruch. Shmo. Shmo. Keep going. Oh dear. It's hard. It's hard. Leolam. 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 Alam. Va'ed. Va'ed. Okay, so that's, so it's Baruch Adonai Baruch Shemo Le'olam Va'ed. Blessed, blessed is the Lord and blessed is his name forever and ever. All right, so next. Baruch? Uh, right here, where am I at? Oh. Baruch. Baruch. Okay. It's hard to see. What's that first letter? Is that an olive? <laughs> no, yeah. I think it's an olive. Olive. Uh, Arcane? No. A grenade. Uh, um, 
Uh, What's that Baruch sitting down below the line? Yeah. Uh, a mistake. Baruch Baruch Shemo Elam Ba'ed. Then we have Gadol Adonai. You see the M is up here also. Umehulal Me'od V'ligulato En Cheker. Right. So this is Psalm 145 with some mistakes. Right. So. This was perhaps not a very good scribe. Um, <laughs> maybe he was in training or something. You can see there's a few places where he uh, inserts some extra extra words. Um, what does this tell us? It's ancient. <laughs> no, we, we know it's ancient. It's in the... It's in the... That's his... Yeah. That's old. That, you know, that. So the, the Baruch, I don't know, Baruch Shemo Lelam Ba'ed, um, is um, appears after every single verse of the song. Oh. So what's the first time the ashray appears in these Dead Sea Scrolls or? Um, like, a, does it appear somewhere? I, I'm not sure if it appears somewhere else, but here it's in its entirety. And what, what is, well, there's a few things that are fascinating about this. One of them is the, the, um, the Baruch Anayi Baruch Shema Lelam Ba'ed, blessed is, Adonai, blessed is his name forever and ever, is it's a refrain. It, it, uh, I think there's a strong possibility that at least in the community in which this psalm is being recited, there's somebody who's reciting each verse and then a congregation is reciting that common refrain after every single verse. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so perhaps this gives us some insight into how a, a very early community was using Psalm 145 liturgically. Now, the Qumran community is not the, is, are not the rabbis, right? So th- they reflect different traditions. And so, you know, what, you know, the way that they, you know, what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the way, and their relationship to material that's found in rabbinic texts is a, big, is a big question. I mean, that's, that's what scholars are, are continuing to work on to this day, but it does give us great insight and it can help us understand what the rabbis are, are doing, uh, either because there's something very similar going on in rabbinic texts or there's something very different going on in rabbinic texts. But the, the fact that this is being recited, presumably out loud in public with a call and response would suggest that it's important in, in, in some way. And so um, we see that it's important for whatever this community was, and there's still scholarly debate about who, the, who were those people who were living in Qumran and where the scrolls came from and were they the same people? Were they different? Were they, yeah, who knows, right? Um, but we, um, we can see that for this community and for the rabbinic community, this was an important psalm. All right, so let's look at the opening verses. We have, we'll come back to the, scroll, the, the Dead Sea Scroll. Tehilal David, that was our, the beginning of the psalm. All right, but that's not how it starts. It starts, right? And it uh, starts that way. Um, and we call it the Ashrei. Right, so the name that we give this prayer is actually from a word that does not appear in Psalm 145. Kind of interesting. The rabbis thought it was so important to say three times a day, and yet the name that we end up giving it is it isn't even from this psalm. Hmm. Happy are those who dwell in your house; they forever praise you, Sela. That's from Psalm 84. Ashrei ha'am shekachalo. Happy are the people who have it so, ashrei ha'am shadonai elohav, happy the people whose God is the Lord. Now look at where this psalm, this verse is from, Psalm 144.15. That is the end of the immediately preceding verse. So right before 145, we have this statement, beginning with ashrei, right? Happy or praised, praised worthy. Or if you spell out the aleph with an ayin, you get Osher, which means wealth or prosperous, right? So lot, lots of layers of meaning, a lot of good reasons why we might want to include this in, in a prayer. Um, 
So we pick up two, wor two verses, both beginning with an Aleph, both beginning with the word Ashrei as a way to introduce Psalm 145. All right, and how about at the end, right? So we get to the end, Shomer Adonai Kolo Avav, Ve'ekhalam Rashaim Yashmid, Tilat Adonai Derevi Ve'erech Kol Basar Shem Kosholam Ve'ed. The final verse, um, the praises of the Lord, let my mouth speak, uh, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. And then we get this verse, Va'anachnu nevarichiyah me'etav yadolam, hallelujah. Right, let us praise the Lord from now and evermore, hallelujah. Kind of a, it's a nice summation. But we've got a missing verse in the middle. All right, let's look at this one. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your reign is for all generations. That's the mem line. And then the samach line. The Lord supports all who fall and raises all who are bowed down. Why mm. might there be a missing verse? Ooh. We left out the nun. The nun is not there. Why isn't the nun there? Because it's at the end. So one theory I heard is that nun um, is for nafal, to fall. All right, well, and we'll, that's we'll, not we'll see that. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see in a moment. I've also heard that it's for the serpent. Oh, Nachash, the serpent, maybe. All right. Other reasons that why there might be missing them? Well, it seems like a thematic shift. Okay. How about sloppy scribe? <laughs> Could that be a reason? Maybe? All right. Oh. All right, let's look at the Talmud. This is the immediate continuation of the passage from the Talmud that we already saw. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, Why does it not, there's no nun in Ashrei, right? So what does that tell us? It tells us that in the time of the rabbis and the Talmud, the Ashrei also was missing a nun. And so, that it was associated with the, the Ashrei verses. Oh yeah, and it's called Ashrei already, right? That's good. Because because it has in it mapaltan, the, the downfall, the fall. So <laughs> look at the word mapaltan, the nun, the, the word to fall is nafal. The nun drops out in conjugation sometimes. So that's why you don't see a nun in this word mapaltan, but it means fall, right? A mapal is a waterfall in, in Hebrew. So mapaltan shall sonay Israel. It's, it contains in it the downfall of Sonei Israel, the enemies of Israel. Now, that word Sonei should not be there. Right? Enemies? It should mean it has in it the downfall of Israel. So why, did, why is Sonei the enemies of Israel? Why, why did the Talmud include that? They didn't like saying... Uh... That Israel was going to fall. Or yeah, we don't even want to say it. We don't even want to say the downfall of Israel, so we're going to say the opposite. And this is something that is a, this this is something that they do often. In fact, the, the Bible itself does this, right? So when Job's wife tells her husband, just curse God and be done with it, so that God will strike you down when he's in all of his suffering, and Job refuses to do so, she doesn't say curse God. She says bless God. Just bless God and be done with it, right? Now she means curse God, but the scribe, the author, you know, somebody at some point um, didn't want even, didn't even want those words to appear next to each other. And so said the exact opposite. And so this is, this is a thing that's done. And so even the, the Talmud does it as well. Um, so the nun contains the downfall of Israel. How do we know this? Dichtiv nafla lotosiv kum betulat Yisrael. So this is from the prophet Amos. There's our word, our nun, nafla, fallen, abandoned or fallen in her land. None will raise, sorry, the virgin of Israel has fallen and she will rise no more, abandoned in her land. None will raise her up. That's pretty dismal. Very dismal. Right? We don't want that. Right? So, therefore, there is no nun in Ashrei. Oh, okay. What do you think of that explanation? 
That's good. I think it's terrible. <laughs> no, I think it's <laughs> Um, it is it's terrible. terrible. It's good when you're trying to make up a reason for why it's missing. Yeah, I mean, like, there's some nice words that begin with none. Yeah. Right? There's some bad words that begin with other letters. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, <laughs> uh, so this, this to me just suggests that they had no reason and they needed to come up with something. But they weren't pulling us out of nowhere. Bumarava metarze lahachi. Marava is the West, right? So in the West, they answered it this way. So the West, where is the West? Israel. Israel, right? So you're speaking in Babylonia. So the West, from your perspective, is Israel. So in Israel, they would answer it in the following way, or interpret it the following way. Nafla velotosif lin pol od kum betulat Yisrael. So this verse from Amos, nafla lotosif kum betulat Yisrael, she has fallen, lotosif, she will no longer be able to get up the virgin of Israel. That's pretty bad. But they did it a little differently. They added a vav. Nafla velotosif. Then they add a couple more words, lean pull od, right? She's fallen, but she will not continue to fall. Kum, rise up, bitulat Yisrael, rise up, O virgin of Israel, right? So that, that's positive. That's turning it around, right? You may be fallen now, but it's time to get up. Amar of Nachman bar Yitzchak. Now, Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak says, Afilu hachi chazar David usmachan baruach hakodesh shneemar somech adonai l'chol anoflin. So, uh, even so, chazar David, David, King David, he went back usmachan and supported them, right? He offered support to Israel, Israel of the future, the Ruach HaKodesh, through well, this is the Holy Spirit, right? Through divine inspiration. David, s- centuries before, know that Israel is going to fall. But it, David, in composing the Psalms, wants to lift Israel up, wants to give them support and encouragement. David, of course, Tiyala David, he's the author of Psalm 145. So what does he do? The very next verse, the Samech verse, right? We Somech Adonai Lechohanoflin. The Lord upholds, really, the Lord supports Somech Lechohanoflin to all those who have fallen down, right? And raises up those who are bowed down. So what we have is the, I guess, those in the West recognizing that, hey, there is a nun in the immediate following verse, right? And it's a significant nun. It's the, it's a, the nun of no fail, of fallen. So this verse they picked up in Amos, they're not picking it up out of nowhere, right? The nun appears in the following verse in the word fallen. So, um, but it, it is switched over into a positive message. God lifts them up when they're fallen, right? So that, that's a pretty good drush. Right. Now, is it the real reason there's no nun? Very base. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Back to Qumran. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a nun verse in here? <laughs> Must be, or you wouldn't be showing it to us. <laughs> okay, let's look closely. This is from the second column. All right. Here's the members. Malchut Cha, Malchut Kol Olamim. Umem shaltacha bechol dor vador, baruch adonai baruch shemo le'olam va'ed. All right, can you make out that? That's a nun. That's a nun, but what's the, what's, what's the word? Naman. 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 All right, so this is an aleph right there. It's kind of hard to see. Now that's a mem. Over here? That's another aleph right there. Oh, it's not a good. Aleph Lamed. Elohim. Elohim. Bidvarav. Close. Bidvarav. <laughs> Neeman Elohim Bidvarav. Or actually, Neeman Elohinu Bidvarav. The Chassid. The Chassid. The Chol. The Chol. The Chol. 
Ma'asav, right? So Ne'eman Eloheinu Bidvarav Echasid Bechol Ma'asav, and then our refrain, Baruch Adonai Baruch Shemol Elam Ba'ed. All right. All right, so there's our the Hebrew. Let's see what it means. Ne'eman is faithful. Eloheinu, our God is faithful Bidvarav in all his, in his words. The Chasid Bechol Ma'asav and kind in all of his actions. All right. So, is this the missing nun verse? I'd like to see their Sadiq verse. Ah, why do you say that? Because in our Sidor, the Sadiq verse also ends with the Chasid Bechol Ma'asad. Ah, so look in your Ashrei. Sadiq is Tzadik Adonai Bechol Derachav, the Chasid Bechol Ma'asad. It has the exact same ending as this verse. And that would suggest the possibility that this nun verse is not authentic <laughs> because it's sloppy. None of the other verses repeat. Why does this one need to repeat? So um, we're, we're left with a mystery, right? So does this reflect a, a tradition of a nun verse? Is this somebody who felt like it's a mistake to not have a nun and they didn't have that interpretation that we saw in the Talmud about the illusion being in the Samech verse? I can't explain. We, we don't know, or I don't know. Maybe somebody knows. But it, it, leaves, it leaves us with a mystery. Mm -hmm. I can't find that. Which, which can't you find? Where are we? This is, you said the, la the end of the, of the Ashray? So, so the Tzadi line. The tzadi line. So oh, the tzadi uh, line. I got it. I got yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. So the chasid bechol ma'asav are the last three words, which are the same last three words that appear here in the, in the nun, this nun verse. Do we have any other ancient writings uh, like the Septuagint or something that? Uh, I don't know. I suspect not. A, I'll, I'll look that up. See if I can figure figure out an answer to that question. Uh, all right, let's. Um, I want to just very briefly look at Ashray. and I'm going to ask us to um, see if you can figure out which is the most frequently appearing word in Ashray, and keep it in Hebrew, and keep in mind that um, prefixes and suffixes are not part of words, right? So if it's got a b or a m or a v or a ha in front of it, there's a good chance that that is a prefix. What to tell? And there's a second question is, is there a word that you might expect to see that we don't see anywhere in Ashray? I don't think there are so many words that repeat themselves for your first question. I don't know. I don't know. I maybe yes, but but nothing else really. Well, I don't see Eloheinu, and wasn't that in that nun verse of dubious authenticity? Hmm. Yeah, there was no Eloheinu. There's a word that appears seventeen times. Really? Huh. Almost once a verse. Times. Cole. Cole. Two letter word. Oh, yeah. Kaflamid. What does it mean? Which, I'm sorry, which one? Kaflamid. Oh. Cole. All. All. All or every. Mm. Okay. What word is missing? 
that you might expect in a prayer in our Siddur. Baruch. Okay, Baruch could be one. Amen. 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 Can you call back? Yisrael does not appear anywhere in here. Oh, that's right. Right? There's no reference to history. Right? No reference to Exodus. None of it. Right? This is a universalistic prayer. Right? And the frequently occurring call is actually a good evidence. Right? It's all inclusive. What is the verse that the rabbis thought was so important that be included? That, that we recite it three times a day, right? You open up your hand, you satisfy the needs of every, of all life, of every living thing. This is a universal prayer. And another indication of its universal nature is the fact that it's an acrostic, right? It's all encompassing, right? This is a way of saying, you know, we're using the whole Aleph Bet. Every, every letter we've got, we're using to, to proclaim your greatness to proclaim your praise. And, um, and, uh, and so we see, so we see Cole appearing so many times as a way of, of, of describing that. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of generic praise, but we're describing God's merciful nature, um, compassion, graciousness, all of these things, you know, benef beneficence. We're describing God as the ruler of all, the creator and ruler of all. The central line is the mem line. Malchutcha, malchut kol olamim. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion in every generation. Um, and uh, and we end with praise. Tilat adonai daber pi. Vivarech kol basar. Right. Let all flesh bless your holy name forever and ever. Right? Then at the very end, va'anachnu, and we will bless you. Who's the we? Maybe this is an allusion to Israel, right? We, the Jewish people, have a particular role to play here in, uh, in praising you, and that's a, that's a theme that we, we see in other prayers as well. As well. Uh, doesn't say that, remember, this is a, not part of what Psalm 145. This is an added verse, um, but perhaps this is a way to allude to um, kind of us as Jews who are using using this as a as an important prayer. So we, we recite this as um, as kind of the beginning of the Hallel section of daily prayer. It's also recited towards the end of Shacharit, <coughs> the end of the Shacharit service. Um, when there's a Torah reading, it, it appears right after the Torah reading. Um, so that, that's the second time. And the third time that we say Ash, the prayer that we, that is known as Ashrei, is, uh, is in Mincha, at the very beginning of Mincha. We don't recite it in the evening service. Um, why not? It's, it's questionable whether the evening service is mandatory or not. And so um, we wanna make sure we get it in three times. So we'll do it twice in the morning, um, once in the afternoon. Maybe it's because it's Bechol Yom every day we've gotta do it. And so we do it during the daytime. Yeah. But uh, that is Ashrei. And, uh, and with that, we will be done with uh, Psuke de Zimra. And uh, so next week, um, we're going to pick up with the intro to Shacharit. I want to look at um, the, uh, there's a, a few prayers that we say on Shabbat and holidays, right? I don't know if at the end of Psuke de Zimra or at the beginning of Shacharit, it comes right before Yishtabach. And it's the prayers that begin Nishmat Kolchai, right? Which is really just a one of one of my favorite prayers in uh, in the prayer book. So I want to spend some time uh, looking at that, and uh, we'll start to transition into Shacharit.